kind of a disclaimer in the book, to be honest. It's my signal post that I put up. But, um, how these papers have been placed in sequence will be made manifest in the reading of them. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of latter-day belief may stand forth as simple fact. There is, throughout, no statement of past things wherein memory may err, for all the records chosen are exactly contemporary, given from the standpoints and within the range of knowledge of those who made them. <coughs> Chapter 1 Jonathan Harker's Journal Third of May, Districts. Left Munich at 8.35 p.m. on the 1st May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place from the glimpse which I got of it in the, from the train, and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, who had arrived late and would start as near as correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east, the most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us amongst the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after nightfall in Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royale. I had it for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. Random, complete recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called Paprika Bendu, and that it was a traditional di a national dish. I should be able to get it some get it anywhere along the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having some time at my disposal when in London, I visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps of the library tr regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance in the dealing with the noble of that country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states, Transylvania, Moldavia, and Bukovian, Bukovina, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map of work given the exact locality of Castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own ordnance surveys maps. But I found the Bistras, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. The population of Transylvania, there are four distinct nationalities, Saxons in the south, and mixed with them are the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magyars in the west, and the Skaxes in the east and north. I am going among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila the, and the Huns. They may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into a horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the center of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Memo, I must ask, ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have been something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my craft, and was still thirsty. Towards morning I slept, and was awakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. 
I had the, for breakfast more paprika and a sort of porridge maize flour, which they had called mamalinga, and an eggplant stuffed with force meat. A very excellent dish, which they called implameta. Implatata. Memory. Remind them this, this as, ask for this recipe also. Yeah. I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before 8, or rather, it ought to have done so. For after rushing to the station at 7.30, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be, <laughs> ought they to be in China? All day long we seemed to dawdle through the country, which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on top of steep hills, such as we see in the old nestles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be the subject of great floods. It takes a lot of water and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the pe peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers. But others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when they got near them and they seemed to be very clumsy about the waist. They had a, a full white sleeves of some kind or other. And most of them had big belts, with lots of strips of something fluttering from them, like the dresses of a ballet, but of some coarse petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slovaks, who were more barbarous than the rest, and their big cowboy hats, great baggy dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous... and had long black hair and heavy black mustaches. They are all very picturesque, but do not look prepossessing. On the stage, they would have been set down on the same old oriental ba band of brigands. They are, however, I am told, very harmless and rather wanting in natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place. Being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bokovina, it has a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made a terrible havoc of five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks, and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war prosper, proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found, to my great delight, to be thoroughly old-fashioned, for, of course, I wanted to see all I could in the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door... I faced a cheery-looking elder woman in the usual peasant dress. The uh, gentleman? Yes, I said. Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white sleeve shirts who had followed her to the door. He went and immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, with the diligence, will start for Bolkenia. A place is kept for you. At Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one, and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula.
May 4th. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count, directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to the details, he seemed somewhat reticent. He pretended not, that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly. At least, he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me anything about his castle, he and his wife both crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refusing to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anything else, for it was all very mysterious, and by not by any means very comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, must you go? Oh, young Ed, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip of what German she knew, and mixed it up with some other language which I did not know at all. I was just able to follow her by asking many questions. When I told her that I must go at once, and that I was engaged to important business, she asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered that when it was the 4th of May. She took her head as if she, as she said again, Oh, yes, I know that, I know that. But do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on. my saying that I did not understand, she went on. It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know what night is when the clock strikes midnight? All the evil things in the world will have full sway. Do you know where you are going? And what you're going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally, she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, at least to wait a day or two before starting. It was very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up and said, as gravely as I could, that I thanked her. But my duty was imperative, and that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes, making a crucifix from her neck offered it to me. I did not know what to think, do, for, as an English churchman, I have not been taught to regard such things as measure of idolatrous. And yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady meaning so well, and in such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the dot in my face, where she put the rosary around my neck, and said, For your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I am writing up this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still around my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear... I do not know, but I am feeling nearly as easy in my mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. <laughs> Here comes the coach. May 5th, the castle. The gray of the morning was past, has passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged. Whether with trees or hills, I do not know. For it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and, as I am not to be called until I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. And there are many odd things to put down, and, lest who reads them may fancy that I dined too well before I left Bistress, let me put down my dinner exactly. I dined on what they called robber steak. Bits of bacon, onion, and beef, seasoned with red pepper, and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire, in a simple style of London cat's meat. And the wine was golden midiash, which produces a queer sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I had only a couple of glasses of this, and nothing else. 
When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken a seat, and I saw him talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they called by a name meaning word-bearer, came and listened, and then looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could not hear a lot of words often re- I could hear a lot of words often repeated, queer words, for these are many nationalities in the crowd. So I quietly got my Poilet dictionary from my bag and looked them up. I must say, they were not cheering to me. Amongst them were Oleg, or Ordeg, meaning Satan, Hokol, meaning Hell, Zergoisha, Witch, Vorlock and Vorslak, both of which mean the same thing, one being Slovak and the other being Serbian for something that is either werewolf or vampire. Memo. I must ask Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the end door, which had this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first. But on learning that I was English, He explained to me that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man, but everyone seemed to be kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn-yard and the crowd of the picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood around a wide archway with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange le- trees and green tubs clustered in the center of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the back seat, Gotza, they called them, cracked his big whip over the four small horses which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears and the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although I had known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us lay green sloping land full of forests and woods, and here and there steep hills, crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses. The blank gable road, the blank gable end of the road, There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossoms, apple, plum, pear, and cherry. As we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spangled with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills of what they called the Middle Land ran the road, losing itself as it swept through the grassy curve, or was shut out by the strangling ends of the pine woods which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but we still seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then why the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borjo Prond. I was told that this road in the summertime excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect, it is different from the general run roads of the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not be kept in too good order, for old hospitals would not repair them, lest the Turk should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war, which was already really, you know, always really a loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of Middle Land, those mighty slopes of forests up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. The right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing out the glorious colors of this beautiful range. Deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where the grass and rock mingled, an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags, till these were themselves lost in the distance the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, 
through which, as the sun began to sink, they saw now again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept around the base of the hill and opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Itenzik, God seat. And he crossed himself reverently as we wound our endless way and the sun sank lower and lower behind us. The shadows of evening began to creep around us. This was emphasized by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset that seemed to glow out with delicate, cool pink. Here and there we passed Ezeks and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that glitter was painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or ma woman kneeling by the shrine, who did not even turn around as we approached. It seems in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me. For instance, hayricks in the trees here and there were beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a litha wagon, an ordinary peasant's cart, with its long snake-like vertebrae, cal calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this, we're sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Sezix, all in their white, and the Slovaks with their colored sheepskins, the latter carrying lance fashion along their sleeves with the axe at the end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness. The gloom of the trees, oak, beech, and pine, though the valleys which ran deep colors and were deep between the spurs of the hills. As we ascended through a pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of the late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through the pine woods, it seemed the darkness to be closing down upon us. Great masses of grayness, which here and there bestrewed the trees, producing a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on through uh, carried on the thoughts and grim fancies engendered earlier in the evening. The falling sunset through the strange relief, the ghost-like clouds, which amongst the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills so steep that despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear it. No, no, he said. You must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. And then he added, with what he evidently meant for a grim pleasantry, before he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you have much enough such manners before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip, and the wild cries of encouragement urged them on the further excursions. Then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of gray light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level as we appeared to fly along. The mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown upon us. We were entering Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with an earnestness, which would take no denial. These were certainly an odd and very kind, but each of them was given in a sample of good faith, with a kindly word and a blessing, and with that strange mixture of fair meaning movements, which I had seen outside the hotel in Bistris. The sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. 
And then as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers craning over the edge of the coach peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected. But though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest explanation. The state of excitement kept me on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the past opening on the eastern side. There were dark, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres, and that now we had got to the thunderous one. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see a glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which steam from our hard-driven horses rose like white clouds. We could now see the sandy road lying white before us. There was no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was ready, already thinking what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the other something that I could hear. I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quietly and so low in a tone, I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own, There is no carriage here. The air is not expected, after all. He will now come to the Bovkeva and return tomorrow or the next day. Better the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst the chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a Kaleshi, with four horses, drove up behind us, overtook us, and drove up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps and the rays fell on them that the horses were coal black and splendid animals. They were all driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned to us. He said to the driver, You are early tonight, my friend, the man stammered in reply. The English air was in a hurry, to which the stranger replied. And that is why, I suppose, you wished him to go to Bukovina? You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much. And my horses are swift. He spoke. Well, as he spoke, he smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth, with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another in the line of Gregor's floor. In this southern, right in the snail, for the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned away, at the same time putting his two fingers and crossing himself. Give me the air's luggage, said the driver, and with exceeding electricity, my bags were handed out and put in the caliche. When I descended from the side of the coach, the Kalichi was close alongside. The driver helped him with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook his reins. The horses turned, and he swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach and by the light of the lamps, and projected themselves on the figures of the late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to the horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill, and a lonely feeling came over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders, and a rug across my knees, and the driver said in excellent German, The night is chill, my heir, and my master the count bade me take care of you. There is a flask of Slovitz, a plum brandy of the country, under the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know that it was there all the same. I felt a little strangely, 
and not a little frightened. I think, had there been any alternative, I should have taken it, instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along, then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again, so I took note of some silent point and found that this was so. I would have liked to have been asked the driver what this all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have had no effect in the case where they had been intentioned to delay. By and by, however, as I was curious to know what time was passing, I struck a match. By its flame looked at my watch. It was within a few min minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonized wailing as, I, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and another, till born on the wind which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country, as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the drover spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated as though after a runaway from sudden fright. Then, far off in the distance, <laughs> mountains on each side began louder and sharper howling, that of wolves which affected both the horses and myself in the same way. Good point for a jump scare, Sam. <laughs> for I was minded to jump from the cliche and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them. He petted them and soothed them, and whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing, with the extraordinary effect, for under his crests it became quite manageable again, though they still trembled. The driver again took his seat, and shaking his reins, started off at a great pace, this time, after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed with the trees, which in places arched right over the roadway till we passed through a tunnel. And again, great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together to, as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with white blankets. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though it grew fainter as we went on our way. The baying of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though we were closing around us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear, but the driver was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head left to right, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses, and jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, unless was at the less, as the howling of the wolves drew closer. But while I wondered, the driver quickly suddenly appeared. Uh, suddenly appeared, without a word, took his seat, and we resumed our journey. I think I must have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of the incident, 
court seemed to be repeated endlessly, and now, looking back, it was like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road that even the darkness around us could not catch the driver's motions. He went rapidly to where the blue flame arose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illumine the place anywhere around it. And gathering a few stones, formed them into a stone, into some device. Once there appeared a strange optical effect when he stood between me and the flame, but did not obstruct it, for I could see its ghostly flicker all the same. This startled me, but as the effect was only momentary, I took it that my eyes deceived me in straining through the darkness. Then, for a time, there were no blue flames, and we sped onwards into the gloom, with the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were following in a moving circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had gone yet, yet gone, and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever and to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. But just then, the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock. And by its light, I saw around us a ring of wolves, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. I was not there. It was on me. <laughs> and they were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than ever when they howled. For myself, I felt a sort of paralysis of fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared and looked helpless around with eyes that rolled in a painful way to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had perform performance to remain within it. I called to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to bre break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the Kalishi, hoping that the noise would scare the wolves to the side so that to give him a chance of, of reaching the trap. How he came there I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound saw him stand in the roadway as he swept his long arms and through the brushing side of the impact impalpable ob obstacle. The wolves fell back, and back further still. Just then a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon, and there we were in the darkness once more. When I could see again, the driver was climbing on the Kalishi, and the wolves had disappeared. This was so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed intermin interminable as we swept on our way, now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept on ascending, with occasional periods of quick descents, but the man always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed jagged lines against the moonlit sky, lighted and warmed with another log fire, which sent a hollow roar up a wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew, saying before he closed the door, you will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself by making your toilet. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into my other room, where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth of the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger, so, making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. 
Let's detour this. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against some stonework, made a graceful wave to, of his hand to the table and said, I pray you, be seated, and supper you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have already dined, and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I much regret that I have an attack of gout from which my lady and I am constantly suffer. Forbids absolutely any traveling on my part for any time to come. But I am happy to say I can send sufficient substitute one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend you to you when you are, when you, yeah, when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. Yeah. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish, and I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. With some cheese and salad and a bottle of old toque, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating, it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time, I had finished my supper, and by the host's desire, I had drawn up a chair by the fire and began to smoke a cigar which he had offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now the opportunity of observing him, and found him of a very marked physiognomy. physiognomy. His face was strong, a very strong aquiline, and very high bridge and thin nose, and peculiarly arched nostrils, with a lofty domed forehead and the hair growing scantily around the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with the particularly sharp white teeth. These protruded over his lips, whose remarkable readiness showed astonishingly vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale, and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm, though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto, I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they seemed rather white and fine, but seeing them close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse, broad, with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the center of his palms. The nails were long and fine, and cut to a sharp point. The Count leaned over to me. His hand touched me. I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came to me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back, and with a grim sort of smile, which showed me more than he had done yet the protuberant teeth. He sat down again, and on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, and as I looked towards the fireplace, as I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed to be a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened and I heard, though from down below the valley, the wolf howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, as he said. <laughs> oh, famous quote, famous quote. Listen to them. 
the children of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression on my face strange to him, he added, Ah, oh, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But I must, but you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till afternoon, so sleep well and dream well. And with a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear. I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. God help me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. Seventh of May. It is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last twenty-four hours. I slept late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I was dressed, had dressed myself and went to the room where we had supped, I found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pots being placed beneath the hearth. There was a card on the table, on which was written, I am to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. So I sat and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I was done, I looked for a bell so that I might let the servants know that I had finished. But I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering one, the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are all around me. The table service was gold, and so beautifully wrought that it must have been from its value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings about my bed were of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics, and must have been fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But, but still, in none of the rooms there is a mirror. There's not even a toilet glass on my table, and I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen the servant anywhere or heard the sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. When I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner. It was between five and six o'clock when I had, when I had it. I looked about for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing materials. So I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. The door opposite mine I tried, but found it locked. In the library I found, to my great delight, a vast number of English books, whole shelves of them and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. A table in the center was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind. History, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and the customs and manners. There were even such books as references to the London Diction Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy Lists, and, as somehow glad to my heart to see me, the Long List. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened, and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way, and hoped that I had had a good night's rest, then went on. I'm glad you found your way in here for I'm sure there is much that will interest you. My friends, he laid his hand down some books, have been good friends to me for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I love to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, and be in the mist, 
in the whirl and rush of humanity. To share in life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look to know it to speak. But Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate, but yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. Through, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that, did I move and speak to your London, none there who would know to know me for a stranger. And that is not enough for me. Here I am noble, I am boyer. The common people know me, and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not. And to know not is what the, is to care for not. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he sees me, or pauses in his speaking if he hears my words, to say, Aha, a stranger! I have been so long master that I would be master still, or at least that none others should be master of me. You come to me not alone as agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of Exeter, to tell me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here with me a while, so that our talking I may learn the English intonation. And I should, and I would that you tell me when I make an error, even the smallest in my speaking. I am sorry that I had to be away so long today, but you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs in hand. Of course, I said I could all I could without without being willing, and asked if I might come to the room the when I close. He answered, "Yes, certainly," and added, "You may go anywhere you wish in the castle except where the doors are locked, where of course you will not go wish to go. There is a reason all things are as they are, and did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps be understanding." I said I was sure of this, and then he went on. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. There, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of the strange things here may be. <laughs> this led to much conversation, as it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake. I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me on my way with him. I noticed. Sometimes he sheared off the subject, or sometimes turned the conversation by pretending not to understand. But generally he answered all. I asked most frankly. Then, as time went on, and I had gotten somewhat bolder, I asked him of the strange things of the preceding night. For as instance, why the coachman went to the places where we had seen the blue flames. Was it indeed true that they showed where gold was hidden? Then he explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night, in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which they came last night. There can be of little doubt for it is a ground fought over for centuries by the Wallachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots or invaders. In old days there were stirring times when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in the wards, and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women. The aged and the children, too, on waiting for their coming on the rocks before the passes, 
that they might sweep destruction over them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little, for whatever there had been sheltered in stranded soil. But how, said I, can it have been remained so long undiscovered? When there is a sure index of it, men will take but the trouble to look. The Count smiled as his lips ran back over his gums. Their long, sharp canine teeth showed out strangely. He answered, because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And, dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasants that you tell me of who marked the place of the flame could not know where to look in daylight even for his own rock. You would not, I dare be sworn, be able to find these places again. <laughs> you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead were even to look for them. Then we drifted into other matters. Come, he said at last. Tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my mistress, or a missness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard the rattling of china and silver in the next room. As I had passed through, I noticed the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study and library, where I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading, and all things of the world, an English Bradshaw's Guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into the plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything. He asked me a myriad of questions of the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighborhood, for he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well... But, my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be all alone, and my friend Jonathan Harker, nay, pardon me, I fall into a country's habit of putting your patronymic first. My friend Harker Jonathan, no, Jonathan Harker, will not be by my side to correct me and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away probably working the papers of the law with my other friend, Peter Hawkins, so. He went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate of Perfleet. When I had told him the facts and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter with them ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across such a suitable place. I read him all the notes which I had made at the time, and which I inscribe here. At Perfleet, on, by, on a by-road, I came across such a place as seemed to be required, and where was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It was surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure, built by heavy stones, and was not, has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates were heavy, old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a, corp a corruption of the old quarter face. As the house is foresighted, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass, it contains all in some twenty acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall mentioned above. There are many trees on it, which make it a place as gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond, or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in several fire-sized streams. The house is very large, and of all periods, back, I should say, to medieval times, for one part of it is stone immensely thick, with only a few windows high up and heavily barred with iron. It looks like part of a keep and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key to the door leading from it to the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views from its various points. The house has been added to, but in a strangling way, and I can only guess the amount of ground it covers, which has, must have been very great. 
There are but few homes close at hand, one being a very large house only recently added to and formed a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day, and, after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also that there is no chapel of old times. We Transylvania nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety in our mirth, not the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters which please the young and gay. I am no longer young, and my heart, through many weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to mirth. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken, the shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. Somehow his words and his look did not seem to accord. It also was that he cast a face that made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Presently, with the excuse, he left me, asking me to put all the papers together. He was some little time away, and he began to look at some books around me. One was an atlas, which I found opened naturally in England, as if a map was much used. On looking at it, I found certain places with little ring markings, and on examining these, I noticed one was near London, on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated. The other two were Exeter and Whitby, on the Yorkshire coast. It was better part of an hour when the Count returned. Aha, he said. Still at your books. Good. You must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm, and we went into the next room, where I found an excellent supper ready on the table. The Count again excused himself, as he had dined out on his way, on being away from home. He sat as on the previous night, and chatted while I ate. After supper, I smoked, as on the last evening, and the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt it was getting very late indeed, but I did not say anything, for I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy, as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing the chill which comes over one at the coming of the dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the change of the dawn or at the turn of the tide. Anyone who has, when tired, as tied as it is, or to a post, experiences change in the atmosphere can well believe it. All at once we heard the crow of the cock coming up with a prenatal shrillness through the clear morning air. Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, Why, there is morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conservation regarded, my dear new country of England, vast interesting, so that I may not forget how time flies us. And with a courtly bow, he left me. I went to my own room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. The window opened to the courtyard, and I could see we, I could see, was the wet, warm green of the quickening sky. So I pulled the curtains again and have written of this day. It may. I began to fear as I wrote in this book that I was getting too diffuse. But now I am glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it, or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night existence is telling on me, but would that that were all? If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with. And he, 
I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. That may be prosaic, so far as the facts can be. It will help me to bear it. An imagination must not run right with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I only slept in the few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window, and was beginning to shave. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning! I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of my glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting, I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error, for the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder. But there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of the man in it except myself. This was startling, and coming on top of so many strange things was beginning to increase the vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the Count is near, but at that instant I saw that the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look at some sticking plaster. The Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with some sort of demonic fury, and he suddenly made a grab for my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then seizing the shaving glass went on. And this is a wretched thing that has done so much mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it. And opening the heavy window with one wretch of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. And then he withdrew without a word. <sighs> it is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless my watch case or the bottom of a shaving pot, which is, fortunately, of metal. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared. I could not find the Count anywhere. So I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle was on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window could fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as I can reach is a green sea of treetops, and occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors and doors everywhere, all locked and bolted. And no place save for the windows of the castle is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I a prisoner. Chapter 3, Jonathan Archer's Journal, continued. When I found that I was prisoner of a sort, a wide feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other things. When I looked back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved as much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was the best to be done. I'm thinking still, and as yet have come up 
to no definite conclusion. Of course, only I am certain that there is no making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and he does, and he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it. He would only deceive me if I trusted him fully in the, with the facts. So far as I can see, the only plan will be to keep my knowledge and fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in dire straits, and if the latter so be so, I need, and shall need, all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut, and knew that the Count had returned. He had not come by at once by the library, so I cautiously went to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had thought all along, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door laying by the table in the dining room, I was assured of it, for if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else to do them. This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves, as he did by only holding up his hands in silence? <coughs> How was it that all the people in Bistris and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, and the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix around my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I would have taught to regard with disfavor as idolatrous should come in time of loneliness and trouble, be troubled me of help. Is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that of the medium? Tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort. Some time, if it may be, I must examine the matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all that I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight, he may talk of himself if I turn the conversation that way. I must be careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvanian history, and he warmed up on the subject wonderfully. And in speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. This he regards explained by saying that to a boyer, the pride of his house and name of his own pride, that their glory is his glory, and that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all the that he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was most fascinating. It seems to have in the whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke, and walked about the room, pulling his great white mustache, and grasping anything on which he had laid his hands as though he could crush it with his main strength. One thing he said which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We let skillies have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as land fights for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ulgric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Wood gave them which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, aye, and of Asia and Africa, too, 
So the people thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here, too, when they did come, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples held in their veins ran the blood of those old witches who expelled the Cynthia, and mated with the devils of the desert. Fools, fools! What devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in their veins? He held up his arms. It is a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, so that when the Magyar and the Gombard, the Avir and the Bulgar, and the Turk poured his thousands on the, our frontiers, we drove them back. Is it strange that when Alipad and his legion swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier? And that is Honofagdalus was completed here? When the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Zlekis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and through us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkeyland. Ay, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for, as the Turks say, water sleeps, the enemy is sleepless. Who more gladly than we throughout the four nations received the bloody sword, or at its warlike fuck called fucked quiver, to the standard of the king? When was redeemed that great shame for my nation, the shame of Kasova, when the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race, as Vivod crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. Who was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk, and brought the shame of slavery on them? Was it not this Dracula, indeed, who inspired the others of his race, who in a latter age again and again brought his forces over a great river to Turkeyland, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again? though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah! What good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without the brain and heart to conduct it? Again, when the Battle of the Mohacs, we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood, were amongst the leaders, and our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Slekis and the Dracula at their heart's blood, their brains and their swords, can boast a record of mushroom growth like the Hafbergs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing these days of dishonorable peace and the glories of the great races are as a tale as that is told. Ego. <laughs> it was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. I don't know. This diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at Cockrow. <laughs> or like the ghost of Helmet's father. <clears throat> Twelfth of May. Let me begin with facts. Bare, meager facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experience which is... <laughs> which will have to rest on my own observation, or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began asking me questions on legal matters, and on doing the certain kinds of business. I had spent the day warily over books, and, simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some matters I had examined at the Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them in sequence. The knowledge may somehow, or some time, be useful to me. 
First, he asked me if a man in England might have two solicitors, or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that the change would certainly be militant against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there were any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say, to banking, and to another look after shipping, in case local help were needed in the place far from home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully, so that I might not, by perchance, mislead him. So he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral in Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place in London. Good. Now here let me say frankly, lest you should think it a strange that I have sought the services of one so far from London, instead of someone resident here, that our motive was no local interest and might be served to save my wish only. And as one of London might, resident might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself to friend or to serve. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labor should only be of my interest. Now, I suppose who... Now, suppose I, who have much affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover. Might it not be that it could be much more eased by doing, by consigning one to these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that solicitors had a system of agency one way or another, so that local work could be done locally on instruction by any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself. Is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business, who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, said he, and then he went on to ask about the means of making consignments, with the forms to be gone through, and of all sorts of difficulties which might arise. But my forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified as all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to your friend, Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anyone. Then you should write now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder. Write to your friend, and to any other, and say, if it will please you that you shall stay with me another month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much. Nay, I will take no refusal. When your master employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted, is that so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interests, not mine. And I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery of the troubles in my face, for he began at once to use them. 
but in my own smooth, in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is that not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of notepaper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign print post, and looking at them, then to him, noticing the quiet smile and the sharp, canine teeth laying over his red upper lip. I understand, as well as if he had spoken, that I should be careful what I write, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes for now, but to write forward to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count, if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat in quiet, reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes referring, as he wrote them, to some books on his table. When I took up my two and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt that I should protect myself in every way possible. One of the letters was addressed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, the Crescent, Whitby. Another to Air Lautner, Varna, and the third to Cowtonco, London. And the fourth was to Heron O'Heron Klopstock, the middle of Hunkers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed, and I was about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just time to replace the letters as they had been and resume my book before they count. Holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table, and stamped them carefully, and then, turning to me, said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. And the door turned, and a moment after his pause, Let me advise you, my dearly young friend, nay, let me warn you, with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old, and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now, or ever overcome you, or be like to do so, and then haste to your own chamber, or to these rooms for your rest will be then safe. If you be not careful in this respect, then he finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he mentioned with his hands, as if he were washing them, I quite understood. My only doubt was to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and misery, which seemed closing around me. Later, I endorsed the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he does not. I have placed a crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, and I went to my room. After a little while, not fearing my, any sound, I came out. And I went up the stone stair to take a look at that towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in that vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me, as compared to the narrow, narrower it was spent, um, accessible courtyards of the darkness. Looking out on this, I felt as if I felt that I was indeed in a prison and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence telling me. It is destroying my nerve. I start at my own shadow, and am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows that there is ground for any terrible fear in this accursed place, 
I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in the soft yellow moonlight, until it was almost as light as day. The soft light as the distant hills became melted, and the shadows in the valleys and the gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was a peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me, and somewhat to my left. Or I imagined, from the light of the rooms and the windows of the Count's room, would not look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullioned, and the weather worn was still complete. But it was evidently many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands which were, which had had so many opportunities in studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter of interest can amuse a man when he is prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the side of the castle. A dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out over him with great wings. At first, I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight or some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear from the mortar from the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality moved downwards with considerable speed, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? And what manner of creature is it that the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, an awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed with terrors that I dare not think of. 15th of May Once more I have seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a long sideway way, in a sidelong way some hundred feet down, and a good deal to the left. He had vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but with no avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now, and there was no use of opportunity to explore more than I had dared to as of yet. I went back to the room, and taking the lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked as I had expected, and the locks were comparatively new. But I went down the stone stairs to the hall, where I entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily enough and unhook the great chains, but the door was locked, and the key was gone. That key must be in the Count's room. I must watch his door be unlocked, so that I may... Get in and escape. I went to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages. The try doors had opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open, but there was nothing to be seen in them except old furniture, dusty with age and moth eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway, which, though it must be locked, though it seemed to be locked, gave under a little pressure. I tried harder, and found that it was not really locked, but the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had somewhat fallen, and the heavy door rested on the floor. And there was an opportunity which I must not have again, so I exerted myself, and with many efforts forced it back so that I could enter. I was now in the wing of a castle further to the right than the rooms I knew, and a lower story down. From the windows, I could see the entire suite of rooms that lay along the south of the castle, the windows of the end room looking both west and south. On the latter side, as well as the corner of a great rock, so that all three sides was quite impregnable, and great windows were placed here in the sling, or bow, and culvern, could not reach. 
and consequently lack in comfort impossible to position which had been guarded or secured. To the west was a great valley, and then, rising far away, great jagged mountain fastnesses, rising peak on peak, the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung to the rack cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comforts than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the yellow moonlight flooding through the diamond panes enabled one to see even colors, lost itself in the wealth of dust which lay over all, and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count, and after trying a little to soothe my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where the old times possibly of some fair lady sat to pen, which much thoughts and many blushes. Her ill-spent love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that was happened, since I closed it last. It is the 19th century, up to date with inventions, and yet, unless my senses deceive me, the centuries old, the old centuries had and have powers of their own which mere modernity cannot kill. Later, the morning of the 16th of May. God preserve my sanity, for to do this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is but one thing for hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think that of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place, the Count is the least dreadful to me. That to him alone I can look for safety even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm, for out of that way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me. Up to now, I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he had made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick, my tablets, it is meat that I put it down, etc. For now, feeling that as though my own brain were unhinged, as if he, as if the shock had come which must end in my undoing, I turned to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help me soothe. The Count's mysterious warnings frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now that I think of it, for the furniture he has is a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear it doubts what he may say. When I had written in my diary, and fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pockets, I felt sleepy. The Count's warnings came into my mind, but I took pleasure in disobeying it. A sense of sleep was upon me, and with some obstinacy which sleep brings the outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight in the gloom-haunted rooms, but sleep here, where the old ladies had sat and swung, and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were so sad that their menfolk away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch from its place in the corner, so that, as I lay, I had to look at the lovely view to the east and the south, and unthinking of, and uncaring for the dust, I composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But I fear, for all that followed was startlingly real, so real that now, sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was uh, all asleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in a way that, uh, since I came into it. I could see along the floor, 
as a bright, brilliant moonlight, my own footsteps marked where I disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me, there were three young women. Ladies by the dress and manner. I thought at the time I must be dreaming when I saw them, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time, then whispered together. Two were dark and had high aquiline noses like the Count, and great dark piercing eyes that seemed almost red in contrast to the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as fair can be, with great wavy masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. Seemed somehow to know her face, to know it was the connections with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy. Some longing, and some at the same time, some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It was not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain. But it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed. Such a silvery, musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound never could have come through such soft human lips. It was like the intolerable, tingling sweetness of water glasses when played by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head cockishly, then the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, to the first. We shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quietly, looking out under my eyelashes in agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath on me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, it sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying, t a sweet, bitter offensiveness as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The fair girl went on her knees and bent over me, fairly gloating. There was deliberate voluptuousness, with, which was both thrilling and repulsive. As she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white, sharp teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten down my throat. Then she paused. I could hear the charming sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips. I could feel the hot breath on my neck. Then the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it ever approaches nearer. Nearer. I could feel the soft, shivering touch of the lips on the super-sensitive skin of my throat. And the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in luxurious ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant, another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count, and of his being, as if it lapped a storm of fury. My eyes opened involuntarily. I saw a strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with a giant's power draw it back, and the blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth chomping with rage, 
fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count. Never did I imagine such wrath and fury even when the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hellfire blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were hard like drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, and then motionless, motioned to the others. They... Th as though he were beating them back, with the same imperious gesture that he had used on the wolves. And a voice which, though low and almost a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring around the room, he exclaimed, How dare you touch him, any of you! How dare you cast your eyes on him when I have forbidden! Back, I tell you all! This man belongs to me! Beware how you meddled with him, and you'll have to deal with me. The fair girl, with a laugh of ribald cockery, and turned to answer him. You yourself you never loved. You never love. On this, the other women joined, and such mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear. I seemed like the pleasure of fiends. The Count turned, after looking at my face attentively, and said in a soft whisper, Yes, I do can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. It is not, is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go. I must awaken him, for there is work to be done. I would have nothing tonight, said one of them with a low laugh. She pointed at the bag which she had thrown upon the floor, which moved as though there were some living thing within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and low wail as a half-smothered child. The women closed around, and while I was aghast with horror, but I looked, they disappeared. With them, the dreadful bag. There was no door near them. They could not have paused without me noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass through the window. For I could see dim outside, shadowy forms for the moment. They were entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down unconscious.